This is Distortion Minimizing Injective Maps Between Surfaces, as presented at SIGGRAPH ASIA 2019, by Patrick Schmidt, Janis Born, Marcel Kampen and Leif Koppelt. We are interested in computing and optimizing maps between the surfaces of 3D objects. Such a map takes a point on one surface and uniquely defines a corresponding point on the other surface, and also the other way around in case we have a symmetric map. A lot of applications rely on such maps, just to name a few there is information transfer, we can transfer a texture, a deformation, or other surface properties. There is shape coprocessing, think of mutual remeshing or computing corresponding cross fields or quad meshes. There is template embedding and a lot more. Many approaches have already been taken to computing maps between surfaces and some popular ones are functional maps or optimal transport based maps. These however don't directly define a pointwise map and we first have to extract one. And extracting a good pointwise map is not always a trivial task. Other classes of methods are non-rigid registration or recent projection based methods. They do define vertex to point maps, but properties like continuity or injectivity of the map are only promoted in a soft manner and cannot be guaranteed. Common defects that can occur without these guarantees are discontinuous jumps or foldovers in the map, leading for example to tearing artifacts in texture transfer. Here these are just visual artifacts, but when we are for example mapping a mesh structure from one surface to another, such a defect can immediately invalidate the result. In all these types of methods, the object that we usually end up with are vertex to point maps, meaning that each vertex of a source triangle mesh is mapped to a point on the target surface. But for points in the interior of a triangle, this map is not directly defined. And most methods rely on a projection operator. This projection, however, is not guaranteed to be continuous. So instead of this, we would like to construct a continuous map in the first place that directly maps each point to the target surface. In addition, we want this map to be injective so that no two points map to the same target location and this includes that we don't want triangles to fold over. So we're interested in the class of continuous and injective maps in a very strict sense. Some methods do produce this type of map, usually by combining two individual maps into a continuous intermediate domain, such as the plane, the sphere or the hyperbolic plane. These maps are continuous and in most cases injective, but what they don't do is optimizing an end-to-end -end distortion measure. Instead, they usually optimize both maps into the intermediate domain separately. To illustrate the difference, here we create a map via two planar parameterizations, both optimized for surface-to-plane distortion. We now use this map to swap the wireframes of both meshes, and we can already see that there is high distortion in the map. In particular, during the optimization, there was no incentive to correctly align the fingers of both hands. In contrast, if we optimize for distortion directly between the two surfaces, we call this an end-to-end -end distortion measure, then this incentive does exist and the fingers align nicely because this results in lower distortion. So we want to have both properties. We want to strictly stay within the class of continuous and injective maps, and we want to minimize an end-to-end -end distortion measure. The existing literature in this problem setting is actually very brief. There are only two methods from about 15 years back that combine these two properties, and we'll compare to them in a minute. We provide a method for this problem in the special case of disk topology surfaces. So as an input, our method takes two such surfaces and two initial parameterizations into the plane, both of them globally injective. We can now compose one parameterization function with the inverse of the other to obtain our surface-to-surface -surface map phi. This map is defined at all surface points that pass through the overlap of both parameterizations in the plane. So we're mapping between subsets A' prime and B' prime of the input surfaces. By construction, the map is continuous and injective. It's actually a bijection between A' prime and B', prime, but since we're not mapping between the entire surfaces, we're sticking to the term injective here. The map is also entirely symmetric, so neither A or B has a special role, 
and constructing the inverse map involves the exact same steps as constructing the forward map. In our optimization, we are now going to modify both individual maps, f and g, into the plane, such that the quality of the composed map phi improves. Let's start by choosing an objective function. Our map is a purely intrinsic object, so we would like to optimize an intrinsic distortion measure. And we use the symmetric Dirichlet energy here as an example. At each point, it equally measures the L2 stretch in both the forward and the backward direction of the map. This is a pointwise measure that we then integrate over both surfaces. At each point, this measure depends on the Jacobian of the composed map phi. Now let's have a closer look at this Jacobian in our map construction and in the discrete case of triangle meshes. So the first parameterization function, f, is defined per vertex of mesh A. So it's a piecewise affine map in the triangulation of A. This means that its Jacobian is constant per triangle of A. The second map, g, is of the same type. Its Jacobian is also piecewise constant, but now in the triangulation of B. The Jacobian we're actually interested in is the composition of the two. This quantity is also piecewise constant, but now with respect to the overlap of a triangle of A with a triangle of B. So we need to compute these overlay polygons, and that includes computing these straight line intersection points in the plane. So we do that, we compute these overlay polygons everywhere, and then we can write down the same energy again, but this time as a sum over these polygons. So we again have the stretch of the map in both directions, but now for a single affine piece of the map, we write it again in terms of both individual parameterization functions. Each piece of the map, each overlay polygon, is weighted by its area, but since we're not integrating over the intermediate domain but over the input surfaces, we have to lift this area, once to mesh A and once to mesh B. And with that we already arrived at our discrete end-to-end -end distortion measure that we want to optimize. And this is not a discrete approximation of the continuous energy, but an exact realization in the case of triangle meshes. The variables of our system are going to be the vertex positions of both meshes in the plane. And the objective function depends on those variables, not only via all of these per triangle Jacobians, with some of them being inverted, but also via the area of each intersection polygon. And this area in turn depends on computing these straight line intersection points. So the dependence of our objective on the variables is a bit more involved here, especially when compared to the classical surface-to-plane parameterization problem, where we can usually just keep all area weights fixed. So to keep the implementation simple, we use automatic differentiation and compute first and second order derivatives. Before we start optimizing, we still have to add a few more terms to the objective for regularization, for injectivity barriers, or to incorporate landmark constraints, but there's nothing really surprising here and I refer you to the paper for the details. Important for us is that we manage to stay within the realm of unconstrained nonlinear optimization. As an optimization algorithm, we start with Newton's method and then later add a few modifications. So the basic scheme is that in each step we compute an update direction and then perform a line search along that direction. Important to note is that we now have to recompute the list of all overlay polygons for each evaluation of the objective, that is in each step of the line search. But this is not too bad because we can do it robustly using exact predicates and it's still relatively fast compared to computing the actual search direction itself. At this point, let's have a quick look back at the two previous approaches to this problem. One of them didn't have the global intermediate domain and had to update one vertex at a time within a local temporary one ring parameterization. And the authors did that along random search directions. The second approach had to resort to a grid resampling of the intermediate domain in order to use image processing techniques. With our formulation so far, we already managed to express the problem as a single global second order optimization that works directly on the vertices of the input meshes. So we can update all vertices at a time and we're not going to suffer from resampling artifacts. 
Now we are going to add two modifications that really make this algorithm work well in practice. First, let's have a look at the continuity of the objective function. Whenever a vertex of one mesh moves and it crosses an edge of the other mesh, then the set of all overlay polygons changes. And unfortunately this can cause sudden jumps in both the gradient and the hessian of the objective function. In fact, this function is only C0 continuous, so there cannot be sudden jumps in objective value, but there can be sudden jumps in its derivatives. And in the worst case, this can cause a vertex to oscillate around an edge of the other mesh. And a single such configuration is already enough for the entire optimization to get practically stuck. These discontinuities are a direct artifact of using piecewise linear meshes. Now, instead of having to switch to higher order surfaces, which is not trivial, we use a much simpler strategy. We apply temporal smoothing directly to the discontinuous quantities, that is to the gradient and the hessian. And roughly speaking, an oscillating vertex now picks up derivative information on both sides of the discontinuity, and this has a very similar effect to actually smoothing out the discontinuities themselves. In practice, this helps a lot. So here on the left, we have the algorithm without derivative smoothing, which gets stuck pretty early, and on the right, with derivative smoothing, it converges nicely. However, in each iteration, it still takes rather small steps. So next, we would like to bias the optimization towards performing large-scale movements first and delaying fine-level adjustments to later iterations. To favor a coordinated movement of vertices, we want their field of update directions in the plane to be smooth. So here D is this vector field, and applying the Laplacian operator to it tells us how the update of each vertex deviates from the average update of its neighbors. And taking the squared norm of this gives us a measure for the smoothness of our update field. Now how do we use this? What Newton's method does is taking a second order Taylor approximation of the objective and then stepping towards its minimum. Now we can simply add our smoothness measure to this approximation and take the according modified update step. And this is very much in the spirit of methods like accelerated quadratic proxy or killing vector field preconditioning, which also favors smooth or rigid motions in the plane. In our case, the strength of the modification has to be controlled by a parameter. And here we start with a very high value and then let it decrease during the optimization using an adaptive strategy. And this really models the cost to fine behavior that we're looking for in our optimization. Here's the same example from before with our final method on the right. Let's play this again. Here's another example where you can really see the large scale coordinated movements that this allows. And you can also see how these movements happen first, and then fine level adjustments like straightening all these little edges only happen towards the end of the optimization. This example with about 10,000 triangles per mesh took 53 minutes to compute. However, 49 of those minutes were spent in auto differentiation, so we're confident that this can actually be quite fast, and we expect a huge speed up from using handcrafted derivatives and other obvious optimizations. We compared our results to state-of-the-art mapping methods. They either give us injectivity guarantees, but without minimizing end-to-end -end distortion, or they minimize this distortion, but without guarantees. With our method, we managed to achieve both properties. In conclusion, we showed how to formulate the intersurface mapping problem for disk topology surfaces. We used the plane as a space to express our variables and to maintain guarantees in, but such that the plane cancels out during map construction and optimization. We then showed how to solve this problem using powerful second order and preconditioning techniques. The most obvious next step would be to extend the algorithm to closed surfaces. However, handling cut graphs and transition functions in this setting is going to be a challenge. Further, we are now able to run into a local optimum of this non-convex problem. 
and we rely on a few landmark correspondences for initialization. So finding good optima automatically would be very interesting. And finally, we think that we brought the intersurface mapping problem a lot closer to the planar parameterization problem, which is extremely well studied. And we applied one idea from this field, the Laplacian preconditioning, but there is still a lot more to explore, especially in terms of optimization methods. This was Distortion Minimizing Injective Maps Between Surfaces by Patrick Schmidt, Janis Born, Marcel Kampen and Leif Kobbelt.